Welcome back to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian thought leaders, influencers, and business owners on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business, where he's the multiplier of your success. I have a great friend of mine here where we've built a relationship through a mastermind that we're actually in, where he's influencing couples, but actually is here as an investor. We were just talking about that he had invested in over 35 mobile home parks. He's working on 19 projects right now. Him and his wife work together as a power couple and also coach couples alongside of that. A phenomenal entrepreneur, but also someone that I see really builds great community. He has a phenomenal place. I still haven't been able to visit his house yet, but he's told me about it. And, and it's really a place where even couples and people can use as a retreat center. So I love his heart. I love his heart for Jesus. I love his heart for his family and his wife and also the amazing investments that he's made. So please welcome my friend, Mike Ayala. Man, thanks for having me. Of course, dude. It's yeah. been awesome getting to know you. We both live out here in Austin. It's been really cool. And, and when I first met you, I saw on the front end couples, right? Like your, your wife has a podcast. You have a podcast. You guys are putting out content you're speaking about couples and the dynamic of working together and growing the relationship yet all of a sudden I pulled back the layer and you're like you're talking acquisitions investing in businesses investing in assets investing in mobile home parks I just think it's really cool just to pull back the layer and be like man like this guy's getting after it yeah you know it's been fun and I've been actually thinking about this a ton lately you go through seasons in life and when I was we started our first business at 24 and then I mean I had two kids at that point in time. And this, this was together. So you guys are yeah. married together, two kids, and, and you start your first business, 24. Yeah, and what was crazy is when, like, going through that season, it was, like, hard and heavy. But what I quickly realized, we went into a season of raising kids, and even though we were successful, I always led with my family and the conversation around, you know, marriage and and just having the life that we wanted. But then Karen and I were just talking about this the other day. It's like my, my kids are now 22, 21, and 19. And there was like a season of almost like silence when it came to like business, investing. We did all of that. We continued to do it, but the focus was the family. And I just feel like you, you were saying this in the intro, like the sleeper side of it. So, you know, family, marriage, all of that. And then you start pulling back the curtain and there's all this business behind it. That's one thing that I'm really proud of, man, is that like, yes, we're all business people. Yes, we need to make money. Yes, we need to do all of that. But the reality is we did a really good job of keeping that family unit first, but we're in a new season where... Like, I feel like I'm just ready to go, man. It's kind of yeah. crazy. Well, you think about the age of your kids as well puts you in that place. Mm -hmm. So though maybe at the beginning of your business, you probably had to like just push on the gas because you're yeah. just starting, but you have two new kids and you talked about there's been different seasons. How did you navigate those seasons to know, hey, now's a time with my family that I'm never going to get back, right? When your kids each year, you never get it back. So yeah. no matter yeah. what season it is, it's a yeah. brand new baby, they usually are changing a lot faster. So if yeah. you miss those months or years, it's gone. Yeah. Maybe when they're 14 to 15, it's probably a little bit less changed than sure. one to two. Yeah. How did you navigate in the season with family and business? When was time to invest more time with family? And when was more time to be invested in the business? I know now you're like, step on the gas. Yeah. Like, well, you've successfully raised the kids and the kids like you have a son who's a professional wake surfer that yeah. like coaches people and I yeah. see all of his content. You have successful kids, which I also want to talk about, but how did you navigate those seasons? And if you could go back, what advice would you give? So, you know, when you go bowling and you put those little bumpers up? Yeah. I think we just have to have things that keep us out of the gutter because I mean, you know, obviously we want strikes in life and I'm not a bowler, but this is just kind of how I see the analogy. We obviously want strikes, but the reality is, you know, as we're navigating life and we're busy, you know, sometimes it's just about staying out of the gutter. And with that, I grew up in a broken household. My dad was, I don't know if we've ever even talked about this, but my yeah. dad was abusive. He was an alcoholic, um, drug addict, couldn't keep a job. I remember as a little guy, sometimes my dad was there and sometimes he wasn't. And usually when he wasn't, when he would come back, there was always this period of time where there was like apologies. He's saying, sorry, my mom's crying, he's crying. And I'm, you know, as a little guy, I'm just trying to figure this all out. Like, what the heck's going on here? What age would you say this was? Um, from one to eight. One to eight. What was your dad doing? He was leaving. Girlfriends. Oh, like bingers. actually physically like, He'd be right, gone well, for peace like. Peace out. Yeah. And then would get like shameful and come back and be like, oh, I'm trying to be better. I, yeah. I only relate to it because I felt like this may have been wrong for me. But my dad really, from what I can remember, mm -hmm. really only said he loved me when he's completely drunk. Yeah. And so like 
you know, but then afterwards they feel bad about, oh, or they get upset when they're drunk, then they say sorry. Yeah, sure. So I get the, yeah. the feeling. So one to eight, your, your dad's blasting off doing his own thing. And, yeah. And, you know, as you fast forward too, I think we can learn as much in life from bad experiences as we do good. Mm-hmm. Everybody's always talking about the good experiences, but honestly, whether it's business, life, family, mistakes I've made, mistakes my dad made, as we fast forward and, and getting back to your question, Karen and I were dating in high school. And I had a really, really um, good sense of what I didn't want to be as a husband, as a human, as a father. Um, although I went off the deep end in high school, um, you know, alcohol, drugs for a while, ended up on meth, ended up in jail. I don't know if we've talked about any of this. <laughs> no, um, dude. Yeah. So to make that would have been my intro. Can we redo the intro? Yeah, I want to cool. introduce you to my friend who was, uh, uh, went to jail on meth. Like that, that'll be my new intro. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> So Karen and I, when we were dating in high school, we always, we, the one thing we've always done is dream together. We always had a bigger vision. We're always talking about what we want life to look like. And so even in high school, we'd be on the phone till one, two o'clock in the morning on school nights. And back then it was landlines. I think you're probably still too young, but you know, mom would get on the phone and she'd be like, go to bed. Like, um, but we were always dreaming. Wow. And then fast forward, got in trouble. Carol was, you know, on the straight and narrow. Then she had rededicated her life to God. I didn't know God. I'm sitting in jail. She sends me a Bible. I end up uh, we can go into this later, but um, ended up getting out, getting my life straight. And then Karen and I end up getting married, like, I don't know, a year and a half later. So I'm 20. She's 19 when we get married. One year and one week to the day, Dylan shows up. So we start having kids immediately. And getting back to your question, like, how do you, you know, how do you keep that and, and the bumpers? Yeah. Um, I knew what kind of husband I wanted to be and what kind of dad I wanted to be because of what I didn't have in my life. And Karen and I had spent a lot of time talking about what we wanted our life to look like. We wanted to travel. We wanted to be present. So to answer your question, I think having a very, very clear vision and a North Star has been super important for me because that, even when I, by the way, we were not perfect. And even within business, there's two times where, there's one time I almost lost my family because I was putting the business first, like actually physically almost lost my family. And so that's what I'm talking about with the the gutters, like these bumpers in life. So two things, having your North Star is the most important. Like, why are we doing this? Which for me was, I want to be a great husband. I want to be a great father. But number two, when we start getting out of line, you know, God will give you signs. Like he'll check you, he'll correct you. And for me, just like, I love having those bumpers that just keep me out of the gutter. Cause, and for me, that's God. Um, Yeah. We're hard headed. And if we don't listen, we're going to end up in that gutter. Yeah, and it reminds me of the promise that you choose your path, but God will direct your steps. Mm. And obviously that's for people that are asking him to, right? Yeah. So, and, and obeying and submitting themselves and saying, hey, like I want help. Mm-hmm. I need some help with this stuff. And I think that's a good point is that, hey, you can choose your path, but like if you have God in your life, like he'll be this director where it's yeah. like, you know, hey, let's go this way or hey, let's maybe go this way. And you talk about North Star. I love the example. There's a quote that says that, a definition of power couples, two people with two different visions coming together, creating one like-minded vision, using their skills, talents, and abilities in order to get to that core wow. vision. And that's really what that power couple dynamic. So it's not just, hey, do you guys work together? I know you guys do. I know my wife and I do. But people be like, oh, I wish we worked together. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, mm. yeah, Jeff Bezos and his wife, they both started Amazon together. But let's say that she was just at home, peace, keeping everything, the family under, uh, in structure, making making sure that his life was made. Like that contribution is like yeah. everything, bro. Like Huge. that is still someone using their skills, talents, and abilities in order to get to the core vision. Yeah. It's still important. And when I hear that dynamic of the North Star, I, I hear that power couple. And, and no no wonder you guys are in that style dynamic. I want to I wanna get to those. Though you had already opened up the can of worms with family side. I think it's so interesting, the dynamic, because I see that some people, they go to church their whole life Mm. and they have to kind of like figure out this thing of on their own. They know their pastor is their God, their church is their God, their community is their God, but they never really ever met God. They just got immersed in the community. Yeah. Some people went great. Some people didn't. Some people like you and I, like I didn't grow up with that. So for you, you're talking about one to eight. You have this example of a father, which a lot of times we look at father and we look at God through our father of someone who's peacing out, you're with your mom, kind of tell, walk me through that dynamic of where were you spiritually and, and what path did you, like, yeah, where were you at spiritually with your father going through that stuff? Um, I had no relationship with God whatsoever. Well, that's not true. 
there was a few periods of time growing up where I felt connected to God, although I didn't have any teachers. I didn't have anybody. My, my grandpa and my grandma were probably the closest people to me growing up. And they had, my grandpa was, um, I don't know if he was agnostic or atheist, um, but it, I didn't have anybody spiritually in my life. How can you feel connected to God then? Like what? Yeah, I remember, I, I actually remember, and these are just crazy things. And I think it was, I think these are those points where God was just revealing himself to me. And they're memories that I have just so that I can look back and know that God was always there. Mm. One time I remember sitting in my bedroom and I was probably 10 at this point in time. And I remember having a pile of money set aside that was for God with no, like no context, no teaching around it, anything. I just had this money that I was saving for God. Nobody had taught me that. I just knew that God was like real. And the first time I ever went to church that I remember or know of, my, my stepdad was working for um, a farm and his wife, the, the farmer's wife would, would pick me up and take me to church. And it was like a Mennonite church or something. So it was like, you know, pretty boxy. Um, she bought me this little bu- picture Bible. And I remember, I'm, I don't know what age I am at this point in time. I'm probably 10 or 11. Um, I remember going to that church and getting this picture Bible and reading the stories But again, I didn't really have a mentor. And I remember asking my grandpa, I was reading a story about Noah and he was 900 and some years old, right? I'll never forget this. And I'm asking my grandpa, I'm like, how did somebody live to that age? And my grandpa was like, well, you know, things were different then. And and he's just trying to translate. And so those are the things that I'm talking about. Like, I know there was check-in points, but I didn't really have a relationship with God and I didn't have any mentorship around it. Yeah, and you you talked about stepdad. So at this point, your mom and your dad had broken up. When I was eight. Oh, so that's why you say one to eight, your dad was kind of jumping in and out. Yeah. Where did he go from there? Where was his I have influence? not seen my dad since then. Um, and and actually... Because you know his name, you know what he looks like. There has to be a, a late night where you're like, let me check on Facebook. <laughs> I've, I've looked for him in the last, you know, four or five years because I want to get my Mexican citizenship and that's the easiest way to do it. <laughs> but I don't know if you want to, you know, go... I'll just say this. Um, there's been a couple points where, including... When I finally got saved, I remember uh, my youth pastor, his name was Pastor Steve. He was given a Father's Day message. And I remember, um, you know, him talking about the heart of the father and how many of us were broken because, you know, we didn't have the father in our life that, you know, God wants to be um, the physical father. And I remember like an altar call at the end where, you know, people were going up there and they were broken. And I was like waiting. I was waiting to be crushed. Like I was waiting for, I was going through all these emotions. I'm like, should I be broken right now? And, and I'm not, am I hard? Is my heart like calloused? And I just, I just wasn't. And then you fast forward when Kara and I, when I asked Kara to marry me, when we were leading up to the wedding, she said, Hey, you know, I think you should find your dad because I don't think you should be bringing, you know, any baggage into our relationship. I want to start fresh. And so I really thought about that and I was considering it. And I went to my stepdad and I said, Hey, I'm thinking about finding my dad. Like, how do you feel about this? And he looked at me and he said, I'm I'm okay with that. But I could see on his face that he was a little bit crushed. And the more I thought about this, and it had nothing to do with the fact that he was crushed. Number one, I felt like, this sounds weird, but seeing that he was crushed by that comment actually made me realize that I had my dad. Yeah. But also the more I thought about that, Nick, the more I realized through a couple of those things, like I had worked through all that, man. I didn't harbor bitterness with my dad. Like I didn't have resentment. I think God's been there with me every step of the way. And it's made me a very forgiving person, actually. I mean, a lot of stuff happened to me when I was young, but I just, I don't have any issues with him. And I think I could look him in the eye today and say, hey, look, I forgive you. I understand there's no issues. I could completely do that. Um, So anyway, I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just interesting. I have a friend of mine. He came and spoke at maybe one of my events and I let him stay the entire time. And, and this guy's got a phenomenal business. And, and I'm just not saying his name just in case for him. Sure. Uh, I doubt he would care. But he's got a phenomenal business. He speaks at my event, but I tell him to stay the whole time. Because I know, never been to an event like ours, a men's event and all this yeah. stuff. So he gets up and he shares and he, and he starts crying because he had never met his dad until like a certain mm. point in his life. And, and when he had met him, there's like this weird connection. Like you have... Heavenly Father. And I think that's a big deal, right? Like yeah. I didn't, my parents broke up when I was four. If I were to just take, oh, I'm going to accept the DNA of my father. My dad drank a ton. Sure. Like, you know, it wouldn't be like, great. I got yeah. set up for success here. I had to at some point be like, 
God is my father. I'm made in the image of Christ mm -hmm. and I'm made in the image of God. I'm not made in the image of my father. Yeah. But there's just still this dynamic. Has there ever been a time for other people out there more so? Ever been a time throughout those years where you're like up late at night and you're like, huh, should I have, you know, like, should I make the connection or even the weirder thoughts of like, man, I've had ones where I'm like, well, if I don't make the connection, then when they die, it won't hurt as bad. Mm. Like I've had, I've, you know, I've gone yeah. through all those where I'm like, yeah. oh, I don't need to. And I'm like, but if I do, then I'll actually connect to them or I could be hurt by it. I know that you don't feel anything. It sounds like you've been healed. You see that you have your, your stepfather. You see that God's your true father and you're not needing anything from him. Mm. But have you ever had those times where you're like, hmm, maybe I should? Yeah, he's really hard to find. Um, I've looked for him. So it's not like a situation where I'm avoiding it. Literally two doors down is a private. I, I saw that actually. <laughs> this is this is not a joke. Yeah, I actually yeah. went and rang his doorbell on accident because I, I didn't realize that it was this yeah, yeah, me too. And he came out and, you know, I, I always think about it. And I've thought about hiring an investigator, but there's just not like, I don't. Yeah. It's just not a priority for me. And um, so, yes, I've had all those thoughts, um, but never, never strong enough to where I'm like, in fact, my 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 cousin one of the last memories I have of my dad, I'm a little guy, so I'm eight years old, right? And I'm staying over the weekend at my dad's house. My parents are separated. And I just remember wanting to go to bed and I'm smelling weed and music and there's always hookers at his house. Like these are the things that I'm remembering as an eight-year-old kid. Yeah. And there was a cousin, cousin Eddie, that was probably, you know, he was probably 15 or 16 at that point in time. And cousin Eddie would always like kind of take care of me um, when these things were going on. And... Uh, I found Cousin Eddie like five years ago. In fact, Cousin Eddie came and worked for me for a while on my accounting team. Um, he's older than me. You know, he's been looking for my dad for a while. He looked for me for a long time. Um, and he finally found us through my mom on Facebook. And so, you know, even all those conversations with Cousin Eddie, my dad's been looking, or Cousin Eddie's been looking for my dad. Um, I could, I don't know if he's alive. I don't know if he's dead. I could take it or leave it. But yeah, I've thought about all that. Yeah, that's so wild. And yeah. and you had talked about, even in your your relationship, you went to this like, this lady was taking the fruit farmer from your from your stepdad was the wife was taking you to a church and gave you the picture Bible that that's some of these are like these seeds, right? Like yeah. I even ha I remember someone in fourth grade gave me a skateboard Bible. I'm walking home from school, never didn't know what it was, but a skateboarder. So they were trying to appeal to the yeah. youth. I take it home and I was actually pumped. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to read this thing. Yeah. And I remember my mom, she didn't mean it, but she's like, oh, it's super confusing. You can't read it front to back. You have to like cross reference and like yeah. jump from this side to this side to understand it. And I was like, okay, I'm in fourth grade. I'm definitely not going to do that. Yeah. But it was almost like a seed. Yep. When was the time where it went from seed to like uh, the way that Brandon actually just talked about, it. he said it went from believer. He's like, I was a believer. I believed in God. And then this instance turned me into a follower. When was that difference? So I was sitting in jail. I was 18 years old. Um, I'm sitting in jail on some methamphetamine charges. Um, Karen and I hadn't talked for probably a year. Because um, you were dating in high school and then, and yeah. then, okay. Yeah. Wow. So when I started going, you know, into hard drugs and um, we always partied a little bit, but when I started, you know, going off the deep end, we, we went separate ways. And so I'm sitting in jail. Kara had given her life back to God because she was raised in the Catholic church and then her mom got saved and then they started going to like a spirit-filled church. And, and I didn't really know, this is really weird, Nick, because even when I would go to her house, like music would be bagged up and set on the porch because it was secular music. And I could tell there was something different, but they didn't really ever like preach to me, you know, but their, their house, you could just feel love there. They yeah. were always really accepting to me, even though they had no reason to be, they were probably like, why is this, why is my daughter dating this guy? But they never really talked about God, but I could tell that something was different there. So anyway, I'm sitting in jail. Kara sends me a Bible and a letter. And she's like, Hey, I've given my life back to God. You know, there's hope. There's this person named Jesus that died for your sins. And, you know, she's just giving me this whole letter and, and there's a Bible. And so I just start reading the Bible and I'm like, literally just to back up a little bit, I, was, I wasn't just using a little bit of meth. I was dealing like some serious methamphetamines. Like we'll talk about this story another day, but cartel, guns, like it was bad. It wasn't wow. just Mike, Mike was doing a few lines of meth. This was, this was insane. So I get locked in jail and I know it's God the way that it ended. And was this after 
the lady was already bringing you to this church? Oh yeah, years later. Oh wow, so you'd kind of like, all right, I'm at this. Yeah, I was 18. I'm here, I understand it, I'm hearing it, it's nice, but like nothing really grabs you where you're like, yeah. I'm totally different forever yet. Yeah, no. Wow. And the reason why I brought up those earlier stories is even if like people are not raised in church or around God, I think God is, I think God is so patient and he's just given us a little, you know, there's, you can check, anybody that looks backwards will see the hand of God in their life at different points. It's just these little check-ins. But no, it wasn't until I sat in jail, Kara sends me that Bible, I get out of jail. And so prior to going into jail, I was done, man. I was like fed up. Um, it was just a really crazy life and it accelerated really fast. I wanted to be done anyway, I just didn't know how. And sitting in jail for a month was just enough for me. So I get out, um, I immediately decided to connect with Kara. Oh, the other thing that she said in the letter too, she said, my parents said, if you need anything when you get out of jail, they're here for you. Wow. And I was like, that was the first moment for me that was like, man, there's people that like love me. And it wasn't just that they were doing a kind deed. It was literally the love of God. Like, why would they, like, why would they want to help me? Mm -hmm. These are the things that are going through my brain, right? Like I've, I've totally destroyed my relationship with their daughter. Like I'm a horrible human. Like, why would you, why would, why would Kara reach out True. to me yeah. and why would they? And so these are those, like, I'm seeing the love of God through humans, which maybe is like, my mom loved me and she's a great person, but I didn't have a lot of loving influence in my life. And just seeing that true love of God through these people was crazy. So I get out, I went to church um, a couple times. I didn't get saved. I'm at a softball game. Kara's sister's playing softball. We're all sitting on the bleachers and her parents are sitting over in a van by the third baseline. And I just get this crazy, like, hey, go sit in the van. I can't, I'm just like, <laughs> so I walk over to the van and it, it's just her mom sitting in the front seat. And I jump in the passenger seat and I just jump in the van and I'm sitting there. And then all of a sudden the back van door slides open and her dad jumps in. And I'll never forget this, man. He's got popcorn. He had went to the concession stand and he's got popcorn and he's just eating popcorn in the back seat. And her mom's telling me about the love of God and how he died for me. And dad's just like watching a movie happen, just smiling. <laughs> and, you know, I, I won't tell you about what he said to me about, hey, I know, you know, some things that you and Kara have done and I just want you to know that I forgive you. And man, I'm like, do I run? Is this guy going to beat me up or is, you know, because I mean, um, it was just a weird scenario. But anyway, I got introduced to Jesus at that point in time, gave my life to God, started going to church. Um, Karen and I were married probably, I don't know, a year later. Um, it's just crazy. Dude, what a, what a cool, I mean, I, I'm, I'm hearing things that I never really would have expected. A yeah. lot of times when I'm talking about even God, God's business, I'm really thinking about like, we, we're called in the business. Like that's what we've all been chosen to do. Yeah. And when you, when you look at a church, amazing, uh, someone had quoted that a lot of churches have taught people how to give, but never taught them how to make money. Yeah. Like taught them how to give money. Yeah. And maybe it's just not their, not their place. Sure. Right. Like maybe, maybe it's us. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that have been called to this area, but a lot of people can't relate to it. You yeah. go to a church and there's not a lot of people that can understand what you're working on or what your dreams are. Yeah. And so how do we bring these two together where you don't have to abandon and go, well, I have my church friends and I have my yeah. business friends. But what I'm even seeing is like this crazy layer of people's lives that we see them on the front end. Oh, he's really changed. But like what's actually been creating the change? And I believe when we highlight stuff like this, how much inspiration would that bring? Yeah. You know, so you guys get married. For her, was this like a, a line? You feel like this was a line marriage. There's sometimes where, and, and has there ever been a time throughout your guys' marriage that faith was shaken in any way on any either side? And how yeah. did, like, what was that dynamic like? Because yeah. you guys have been married for how long now? Because this is before your kids. So your kids are yeah. 25, you said? Was 22, oldest? my oldest is 22. Oldest 22. And that's yeah. your son that's the wake surf. Pro. Yeah, yeah, Dylan. Dylan, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, you guys have been married for a while. So this yeah. is a long time to walk out of faith journey. It's one thing to be like, I had this radical experience, gave my life to God, so did she. Yeah. It's a whole other thing to have kids, business, all these crazy things. So maybe actually just bring me to the point where when was it when you almost lost the family? Because this must have been a time where it was, yeah. <laughs> something wasn't going right. Yeah, well, I can kind of intertwine a few yeah, things please. here. So um, we get married and... You fast forward maybe two, three years. I'm working. So Dylan's born. Tim is born. K 
Kara's pregnant with our third kid. We're going to church. Pumping them out. Yeah, we're youth pastors, by the way, wow. which you probably didn't know. Beautiful. Um, yeah, we've got an ex- like a youth ministry that's just exploding. I'm working full time as a plumber. I don't know if you knew I was a plumber. I, I remember just because I was a carpet cleaner. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm working full time. I'm working out of town. Um, I'm running this $3 million job, which is kind of irrelevant, but I get thrust probably, you know, earlier than my time. Um, but I get thrust into running this job out of town. And again, Kara, we have two kids and she's pregnant with our third. I'm working out of town seven days a week, um, literally like 110 hours a week. I kid you not, because I'm running this job. I have 20 employees. It's at a casino remodel. So these guys don't care how much the ticket is. Just keep going. So I, I would work all day, you know, 12, 15 hours a day. Then I'd go to my room and I'd do change orders and paperwork because I'm running this job. I would go home Sunday night at like seven, eight o'clock at night, drive home hour and a half, two hours, wash my clothes, have a cold dinner, turn around at three o'clock a.m., head back and do it all over again. So if you look backwards, like we had this life that we had designed, like I'm going to be a present father, I'm going to be a present husband. This is not what we signed up for. And so through God and a series of events, like we just left and started a business at the age of 24. Um, I'm like, I'm not putting up with this. And here's what I actually thought. Sometimes it's easier to look backwards and change the story a little bit. But what we actually talked about, Kara and I, is if I'm going to work 90 or 100, 110 hours a week, I might as well do it in my own business. Mm. That was my frame of reference starting that business. So we, we left. We started a business in 2004. Um, Kara's dream was always to be a stay-at-home mom. So you kind of mentioned something earlier about, you know, when you're talking about Bezos and, and working together and she always knew what she really wanted to do. And I always, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur, Nick. It was not like, this was not something that I'm like, I'm going to be a business owner. It was because the vision and the life that we had, I was, I I was not able to do that working for somebody else. And so that's why I started my business. But anyway, you fast forward a couple, uh, maybe, maybe a year. So we launched our business in, um, it was actually July of 2004 that we got our license. And our business is just blowing up. By the end of that year, we were doing a million dollars in revenue and had 17 employees already. What was the business? Plumbing and heating. Cool. So, and you were already doing that before? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So then you just were like, well, I know how to do it. So yep. I might as well. Yeah. Do it and, and a lot of it was like opportunity. It was God. I think, you know, you don't know this at the time, but um, so many people were wanting to come to work for us that we had worked with in other companies and even competitors. And so people just start coming to work for us and clients are jumping ship coming to, you know, on our side and this thing's just blowing up, man. And I'll give a little business insight here. I was so young and knew nothing about accounting, sales, any of that. I was so not a business owner and didn't know anything about it. I knew I had to hire consultants and coaches. Every chance I got, I was bringing in a coach and I was so naive and young. I just did exactly what they told me to do and it worked. Um, And so you fast forward we have a bunch of construction projects going on. We don't have enough employees. We're working all day in the business. And then me and my partner are coming in at night doing estimates and billing. And so it's my wife's grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary in Wyoming. So I tell my partner, hey, I'm flying to Wyoming on Thursday. There's a party on Friday night. I'll be back Sunday. No, you can't leave. There's too many jobs. And we're doing a Home Depot. We're doing a bank. We're doing all these construction projects don't have enough employees. I'm like, I'm, I'm going, it's, it's family. So I go the entire time I'm there, my phone's ringing, contractors are calling me, employees are quitting. Like it's just chaos. Right. Mm -hmm. So I tell my wife, I said, Hey, look, I'm going to go to the wedding, the anniversary on Friday night. And then Saturday, I'm going to book a plane ticket out of here. We had drove to Wyoming. Okay, fine. So she drives me to rapid city the next morning. I fly out. They're driving home Sunday or whatever. Maybe it was Monday. And I'm at the grocery store getting groceries and my phone starts ringing. I don't recognize the number. I just shut it off. Rings again, like three times. So I answer it and it's this lady screaming and she's like, is this Mike? Blah blah. blah. And I'm like, yeah. And they had rolled three times. Uh, Her sister was driving and something, she got distracted, went off the road doing 85 miles an hour, um, rolled the car three times and they got in this crazy wreck. And, you know, Kara was in rough shape. Her sister was in, you know, even worse shape. The kids were fine, but it kind of led us into this, like they got for literally for three hours because where they wrecked was actually the town that I was working in out of town in. It's kind of crazy, but I'm waiting for the ambulance to show up in the town that we live in. 
and they're just like not coming, but they're telling me they're on their way. Well, then like three hours goes by, which should be like an hour and a half, maybe two hours max. They're still not there. We're calling highway patrol. We're calling the sheriff's department. Nobody knows where they're at. They finally, like three and a half, maybe four hours later, they're like, oh, they took them to Salt Lake City. I'm like, what? So I didn't get to the hospital in Salt Lake City till like two o'clock in the morning to see my family. And it was like one of those moments that just shook me to the core. I'm like, and it, I don't know, we're maybe two years into this business, if that. But it was a moment where I'm like, okay, here's the crazy thing about being an employee. You can blame it all day long on, you know, your boss is making you do this, your boss is making you do that. But when you go into entrepreneurship and business, there's nobody but you and God. And I think business owners make a bunch of excuses about why they can't be a better husband, why they can't be a better father, why they can't be a better friend, why they can't take the time to get into coaching, ministry, et cetera. And the reality is that was the first moment in my life where I realized, you know what? Nobody is responsible for what I decide and what I do in life but me. I couldn't blame that on my boss. I couldn't blame that on, you know, my clients telling me that was me and me alone, man. And that one thing could have cost me my whole family. Thankfully, it didn't. But those are those gutters that I'm telling you about, like the, the bumpers. That was one of those moments where if we didn't adjust, who knows what could have happened, man. And those are those things on the, those are those like mile markers on the road that we have to pay attention to. And was it the dynamic that you're like, I would have been driving? Is that what you were thinking at the time? Because, you know, and, and with a grain of salt, right? We shouldn't sure. live in this crazy fear of like, I can't tell you that one of my biggest fears that I struggle with, and, and it's been difficult having a nanny with my son, is the thought that if she drives him to the park, mm. if I just went, I would drive them and I feel much more secure. And if anything were to happen, I don't know what I would do with myself. Because I know, right? So there's that that unhealthy side of it, but also the, the healthy side of it that sometimes like there's these defining moments in our life that are positive or negative, that they're so small, but they can just, you know, one little thing can happen. I had my next door neighbor growing up. He, uh, he was on a quad. He was 13 years old and woke up in the morning. They went and hit a little jump on a quad and he fell over, snapped his neck and was dead. Yeah. And it's like, you're not going to be like, hey, no one in the world can ever jump a quad again. It's just sometimes these little things just like, yeah. so how did that speak to you? Like, why was that important? Did I you feel knew, like you should be there? I knew I should not have left them. Got it. So you felt that and then you did it anyway. And then it was shaken because you're like, I would have, you would have probably been driving, right? Sure. Yeah. I don't know. What, I would have been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, I don't, I don't live my life in fear. Um, yeah. My kids are, you know, they've, we've motocrossed, like we've, we've done it all. So I don't live <laughs> in my, I don't live my life in fear at all. Yeah. It's just those moments when you know you need to be doing something. Mm. That's all. I knew I shouldn't, I knew I was leaving. And even before I left on that trip, everything was trying to get me to stay. And I'm like, no way, I'm not missing this. But then, you know, once you get settled in and it's like, you're there, it's no big deal. I can leave early. I knew I shouldn't, that was like a, that was one of those monumental like family moments. Mm. It's a 50th wedding anniversary. It's the first time that Kara's entire family had been together for, I should have, I knew I should not have been leaving that. So I think that's the key, whether, you know, your audience is, it's primarily listening to God, but your intuition, that yeah. inner self, like when you know you're supposed to do something, do it. Because that's the thing. I'm not saying we shouldn't get on a quad. I'm just yeah. saying when you know you need to do something, do it. And we need to prioritize our families over everything. And again, it was just a moment for me where it's like, I can't blame this moment on anybody else but myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you kind of brushed over your transition from business, from working to business and like the whole family dynamic. I'm, I'm interested as well, intertwine it with what was your transition after that? Because there must have been a difference. Because mm -hmm. it seems like these are just key pivotal points. But you made it seem so easy. Like there's so many fears when you're leaving on your own, right? There's influences, there's fears of letting other people down, your boss and people that you look up to, failure, your wife. There's there's a lot of dynamics. There's also that like emotional side of what was it like to meet with your wife and be like, you had to have had those I don't know you moments because you're gone all the time. Yeah. Like that's a difficult thing. So walk me through that because I feel like other people, if we brush over it, they, they just won't feel like it's not like their situation. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a second scenario. And it wasn't that much later. It was 2007. So it's three years after we started our business. I probably have, you know, 80, 90, 100 employees at this point in time. I don't know the exact number. Um, and we're just crushing it, man. It was like, we had some key clients that were like pushing us to grow. Um, a lot of amazing contracts. There was one particular gold mine 
that had had a, the EPA had shut them down and they were losing like 5 million bucks a day for every day they were shut down. And a big part of this was like, um, so we were a plumbing company, but we did a lot of industrial work too. A big part of it was a propane pipeline. And so they needed a new propane pipeline. So we had a crew 24 seven out there as much overtime. They were just like open check, but this mine was struggling. And so we had them on a seven day pay period because we knew they were financially struggling. But again, this is two crews around the clock, seven days a week, like working 12 hour days each. So this is big money. And one day I get a phone call from one of my crews, the crew boss, and he's like, hey, the gate's locked. Well, the, the mine had gone bankrupt and they owed us 400 and some odd thousand dollars, which was a ton of money um, for me at that point in time. It's, it's a ton of money for anyone. Um, they owed us a bunch of money and we didn't know when we were gonna get paid. And so then, also, like we're heading into 08, things are starting to tighten up, like all the companies are starting to, man, that Christmas, Christmas of 2007, I had to look a guy in the eye that I had tried to get to work from, come to work for me for like two and a half years, that was like a family friend and a mentor of Kara's, used to be her youth pastor years ago. Um, he left a job that he'd been at for like 27 years, came to work for us. It was in the heyday, we were growing. I had to look him in the eye at Christmas like three days before Christmas and tell him I had to lay him off along with like 35 other employees. And dude, that put me in like this. So we've got this mine that went bankrupt. I can't pay my bills. Um, the other mines are like slowing way down. Construction projects that were supposed to get started. were coming to a halt. Everybody's freaking out. We're heading into 08. Dude, that was a stressful time for me, man. And, and this is where times where you're like thankful for mentors. I remember having a mentor sit in the conference room with me all day, just trying to figure out, you know, how we were going to pay our bills and, and how we're going to like navigate all this debt. And I'm flying to Reno to meet with, you know, vendors that I owe money to and I can't pay them because the mine shut down. But it, it taught me to like confront issues head on because everybody was super cool. And real quickly too, one of my mentors always told me, if you want favor with somebody, you got to look them in the eye. When that mine went bankrupt, I was watching the news. And this is the difference between people that are successful and not. I, I was just watching the news and, and uh, the CFO had gotten fired, the CEO got fired. The mine was based out of Vancouver, Canada. And they had announced that they um, put an interim CFO in place. His name was Sean Heinrichs. I'll never forget this. I didn't know the guy. But it, so I immediately, I was like, I just had this, hey, if you want favor with someone, you gotta look him in the eye. So I, I, I look up uh, Queen Stakes parent company in Vancouver. I get their phone number and I call them and I'm like, can I talk to Sean Heinrichs? <laughs> and the secretary is like, can I ask who's calling? And I'm like, this is Mike Ayala from Queen Stake. I just, you know, um, hold on. And I expect fully for her to take some kind of message. This is Sean. And I'm like, Sean, my name's Mike. I work at Queen Stake. You don't know me, you owe me a bunch of money. I realize your, your world's probably upside down right now. I'm gonna be in Vancouver next Wednesday. Can I meet with you? I wasn't gonna be in Vancouver, but I'm like, I'm gonna be in Vancouver. And he's like, yeah, sure, how's one o'clock? And I'm like, great. I flew to Vancouver, I sat in front of this guy and I'm like, dude, you're, this is gonna crush my business. I'm not a big you know, multinational company. Like, is there anything you can do? And he's like, actually, I have a slush fund. I can cut you a $75,000 check right now. Um, all this to say, you know, just favor, get in front of them. I just thought that was valuable because I think, you know, when we look upon, you know, when God looks at us, we have favor, but it, it works with, with people too. Like mm -hmm. we really need to, we need to see that and we need to be that. So I'm going through all this stuff and I remember walking home one night and it's probably eight or nine o'clock at night. I'm stressed out. I'm back to working seven days a week again. And, and Kara's like, I snapped at one of the kids or something. I don't even remember what triggered this, but she's like, hey, you're not yourself. And I'm like, what do you want me to do? Like we could literally lose everything. Like my business is failing. I don't know how I'm gonna pay for anything. And she looked at me and she said, what are they gonna do, take our kids? And I was like, all these little you know, bumper moments, they just bring us back to like what really matters. And this is the thing, I think sometimes people think that you know, business is easy. I'm talking to business owners left and right now, including me that our businesses are, you know, we're going through another challenging time right now. And I've said this for years, we, it doesn't get easier, we get better, we get bigger. Mm -hmm. But also you add a zero to your business, you add a zero to your revenue, you add a zero to your employees, meaning you go from 10 to 100, it just gets more challenging. And I think sometimes people look from the outside and they're like, oh, must be nice, you know, Nicholas is running this huge empire. No, the problems just get bigger, but also this is where 
as long as we stay to what's true and we come back to our North Star and what's guiding us, God is bigger than all of that. Our values are bigger than all of that. We'll get through any of it. And Kara's always the one to just bring me back and remind me that. So um, just wanted to share another, um, it was just another moment. And yeah. We haven't had very many of them since then. doesn't mean that it's easy, but I just try to stay true to like, why are we doing all this? Yeah, and I'm sure that those I, I'm sure that those pivots are available to you. Right, like you've learned from these different things. It's not like you have to go through something hard to learn. Sure. It, I think they say a wise man, a, a dumb man doesn't learn from his mistakes, but a wise man does. But a wiser man learns from other people's mistakes. Yeah, and that's our goal yeah. is to take your mistakes right now, even. Yeah. And people are like, all right, how can I audit my life? How can I look through his lens? And and what we would call it is your ceiling becomes our floor. Sure. So you're like, this is where I've built up to. I've built to the hundredth story of this skyscraper. I could either start just building my own and be like, forget this guy mm-hmm. or get the mentors, listen to episodes like this and be like, yo, man, I'm going to take off from where you start stopped building. I'm going to just keep going from there. Yeah. And that's how we get innovation, right? Like the light bulbs in the studio. We weren't like, oh, forget that. I'm not going to use the schematic or buy them. I'm just going to make them. Yeah. Let me get the hair from my head and put it on. Yeah. See if I can make it happen. We, we're allowing these things to progress us even further forward and you've done that in your own life yeah. and even with the dynamic of how long was your wife a stay-at-home mom the way that she wanted to because now she's like on social mm-hmm. she's she's producing content you guys are doing things together yeah when did that transition start happening where she started getting this this urge it, my my wife's mom was a stay-at-home mom homeschooled everyone yeah didn't really work a ton now she's like literally like producing content all the time. She's she's killing it. It was like this transition, but it's difficult because you're you're your identity over here, and then yeah. you have to change it. I'm sure that's been interesting. So yeah. when did that start? Well, I think with anything, there's seasons, right? Because when the kids are little, and this is where this is where we have to be careful as you know entrepreneurs, business owners, and just people in general, because there's just seasons. You've got to be so aware of the season that you're in. And as the kids started getting older, um, you know they don't need you as much. Mm-hmm. But you're still in that position where you know you want to be free, and there's a lot of little things that um, you know we always did along the way. And you know, for me, I've always brought it back to I call it REM, not not the band, but just relationships, experiences, and memories. And for us, it was always about that. And so when you look at Kara, like she just always wanted to be free and there if the kids needed her. And so as she started getting older, I mean, there was a really big turning point. We actually came to Austin. We were living in, I think we were still living in Nevada. No, we had been in Arizona at that point. I think it was 2017. We came to a couple's goal setting retreat here and you could tell she was at this like transition period um, where she was looking for, she had had been working in the businesses, but not like a full-time role. Like she would come in and out as we needed her. Um, I always called her the Navy SEAL because you know, when somebody would quit or we'd be really busy, she'd come in and help. Mm -hmm. But that 2017, like I remember sitting at the one thing, and you're taking inventory about what you want, what your vision is. And I just remember going to uh, Doc B's up at, um, at the domain and sitting there and just listening to, you know, she's like, I want, I want to teach women. And it, I wasn't, she wasn't clear on what that really meant or, you know, what that looked like at that point in time. But when you kind of fast forward two years, three years, four years later, um, she's got a, a, a company called Rain & Co that's like um, teaching accredited investor females like how to invest. Um, She's got marriage money and mayhem. And so like she really had a heart to just teach and guide and mentor women. And you're starting to see that really flourish. And so I think it's just an evolution. And again, I think the season is important because I think people have things in them. And I think the hardest, most noble thing to do is to keep something dormant when it's calling, but the season isn't ready yet. And I watched Kara fight that for a while when the kids were in that in-between. Because when they're younger, I don't even think, I mean, other than here, take the kid, um, I don't think they're really like longing, you know, you know what, I'm gonna go do this if they're really called to be a stay-at-home mom. But as she got older, I could see her really battling that. Yeah. Uh, Because you're kind of in this in-between, the kids don't really need you. So you have an extra four or five hours a day, but what if they do need you? Um, That's the tough season, I think, for women or men yeah. Um, to be in is when you're kind of in, in, in the in-between. But that 2017 coming to that couple's goal setting retreat, I think was a pivotal moment. So it was interesting because I was already thinking of David when you were talking about this. Uh, and then and then even further so when when David when Saul was king, David knew that if he wanted to become king, he had to wait for God to be mm. to promote him. But 
David was always meant to become king. Yeah. Like it was all, it was always his destiny. So yeah. it was, uh, there's that, even in Veggie Tales, it was crazy because I read the story, but then my son's watching Veggie Tales. Yeah. I try to get him to watch it at least. And and it's literally this moment where David's there, Saul comes into the cave and, he's, and he can kill him. Yeah. And literally he would become king. And even God had said, I will deliver your enemies to your hands. Mm. And, and so all the pro- everyone there is like, this is your time. Yeah. So even sometimes your friends, the closest people around you could be like, yo, you deserve this, man. Go out on your own. You got this. Like, come on. Because they see the destiny, but the timing isn't right. Yeah. And he didn't kill Saul. He had the opportunity to because he knew that if you rush into a season, like you're now have to keep it. So mm-hmm. I, I heard that from there. But also I see in your guys' life, so I think that's big. Like what? And, and I don't want that to be an excuse for people not to get after it. Because sure. that's common too, right? It's yeah. like, well, it's just not my season. I don't know this one. And then you die and you're, yeah. you never got into yeah. a season. Bro. Yeah. Like there's a reason why he says you choose your path and then directs your steps. Yeah. Like you have to be on a path. Even the yeah. disciples, they were preaching. They, God said, ends of the earth, preach yeah. Jesus. They would go all the way to a city sometimes and God would say, not this one. Yeah. They freaking walked all the way there. Could yeah. you imagine you walk all the way here and God says, actually do the podcast another day. Yeah. You walk all the way home. Like, yeah. what? Yeah, <laughs> like that would just really suck. Yeah. Uh, which actually just spoke to me, by the way, just on even they had to sometimes turn around. Yeah. Uh, and that just even spoke to me. But David was tending to sheep, mm. fighting off bears, lions. Mm. And then all of a sudden this tiny little dude just knocks out Goliath, right? Yep. And it's like all the doors open to him. I see that path for you guys, right? Is like each part of this has been an equipping. Mm-hmm. There's been a bear, there's been a lion, there's been an equipping. Maybe even the Goliath's still ahead. We're just gonna yeah. rip it, and and who knows? But that's still that equipping's there. What then took you guys to start investing more so? And we know that that's still active, right? It's not mm-hmm. like you're like sure, you know, passively just not working at all. I'm sure yeah. there was an active side to it, and then a passive side. And then I also know that you're still wanting to get back into an area that used to be before, sure. which we had talked about. Yeah. So walk me through the seasons, the equipping. How, how do you look back and see how God has equipped you and how have you heard from the voice of God on those seasons? And what made you guys get into the investing side? Because you had 30 plus mobile home parks. It's like, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah it's, it's so interesting to me, man. The, the journey that everyone's on is very unique. So yeah. open yours. Um, so we started the business in 2004. In 2005, and this goes back to the coaching and the mentoring, Mm -hmm. I was working with a coaching company. I had a head coach. My service manager had a service coach, and my accounting team had an accounting coach with a single organization. I was at a three-day annual business planning event in 2005. Um, So I'm I'm a year and a half into this business, man. It wasn't wasn't that long. Um, My coach from stage said, if your business isn't helping you achieve your personal goals, you just own a job. And I was like, man, that hit me right between the eyes. Because, you know, if you go back a year and a half, like, I'm, I don't have freedom. And so I think, well, I'm just going to start my own company so I have freedom. But then you look like I didn't have enough freedom to say no to flying home on the 50th wedding anniversary. I didn't. So from a very early age as an entrepreneur, I realized, like, I don't want to be a slave to this business. Mm-hmm. And when he said that, Listen, these little sign markers are there for every one of us. It's just, are we going to see them? Are we going to listen to them or not? So it's not about whether we jump on the quad or not. It's not about living life in fear. It's like you either hear the message or you don't. And the faster you hear the message, the less time you're going to be in the in the wilderness, right? So yep. um, I hear that statement. And Kara and I had done some pre-planning leading up to that profit launch, they called it. And the question was, if money and time was not an issue, you know, what would you own? Where would you live? What would life look like? And what investments would you make? And on the investment part, it was like, we set a goal. We said we would buy two income producing properties a year for 10 years. Because in my mind at that point in time, I'm 25 years old. If I bought 20 investment properties over the next 10 years, so I'd be 35. Then 30 years later on 30 year mortgages, this is how I was thinking about it. By the time I was 65 years old and still running this plumbing and heating business, I'd have 20 houses to retire on. We got to remember that our vision, you know, we're only going to get the glimpses of the vision that we're ready to receive. So at that point in time, I'm thinking that I'm going to be 65 years old, still running my plumbing and heating company that I sold in 2014. And I'm also thinking that 20 
20 houses is like my BHAG, man. This is like, this is the thing. Yeah. So we go back. I bought two single family properties that year. By the way, there was another voice, my CPA that was telling me, Mike, you guys are spinning off a ton of capital. Like you need to start getting some more write-offs, buy more trucks, invest in real estate, whatever. I didn't know what that really meant. But again, it's the signposts. And so we bought the two properties. Um, and one of my mentors, Dan Sullivan from Strategic Coach, he always says, the eyes only see and the ears only hear what the brain is looking for. So when I said I'm going to buy two income producing properties a year for 10 years, all of a sudden, you just start connecting the dots. And people, people are just bringing me deals. And I'm like, how do you even know I'm looking for real estate? I'm at lunch with a friend, like, and he's telling me, I need to get out of this house because my family's growing. And I just paid him $5,000 and took over his mortgage. Like, this is the kind of stuff that starts happening when you get clear on it. Year two, we got, we got the two done in year one. Year two, a 72 space mobile home park deal falls in my lap, like comes out of nowhere. Um, we're doing a bunch of plumbing work in this mobile home park. The owner's in bad shape out of Vegas. She's an investor. She needs to get out from under it. There's an assumable um, first position note from a private money lender at 7%. I call him. Yeah, you can assume it. No problem. She needs $85,000 cash to get out of the deal. I talk to her, talk to the lender. I don't have the cash. I go see my mentor that told me, get in front of the person with favor. I'm like telling him, hey, should I do this deal? He's like, you're lucky you're my friend or I would take this deal from you. This is a good deal. Go buy it. I'm like, I don't have the down payment. He's like, I'll lend you the down payment. So he lent me the $85,000 in second position. I assumed the first position loan. So I get into this community for uh, $470,000, 72 space mobile home park with no money down. Thing cash flows from day one. I sold it three years ago for like 1.65 million after it cash flowed for, you know, 10 years or whatever the timeline was. But anyway, we just kept stacking. I ended up with three commercial buildings, 45 single families, five mobile home parks. When I sold that business in 2014, that was mine and Kara's portfolio. So when we sold in 2014, I've often said it was the best and worst day of my life because I didn't know, like I wasn't planning an exit. Like I was plumb line, plumb line was me. Like I didn't, that was my identity. And so I kind of went through this period of time where it's like, I'm, I'm retired. I'm literally making 300 and some thousand dollars a year, even if I don't get out of bed, which makes you kind of want to not get out of bed sometimes. And yeah. it's like, dude, it made me realize that money, that's the relationships, experiences and memory. Cause this is not about money. This is about really that North star and the audience. And you know, everybody listening needs to figure that out. Like, what is that for you? Because money is never going to solve your problems. And even like I was saying earlier, it's a challenging time for a lot of people. And I understand that, but money isn't the problem. Money isn't what's creating our issues or lack of. It's our head. It's getting our head on straight. And so even when I retired and have this six-figure exit for the next 10 years and you know this valuation that was kind of crazy and I've got all this real estate that's like cash flowing and that, that didn't make me happy. I had to come back to my, you know, what's my purpose? What's my passion? And so I'll button it up with this. Um, but in 2016, I joined uh, the Real Estate Guys Mastermind I met my business partner and I just start getting reconnected to like my purpose. And that's when I went into real estate investing full time. And we started buying mobile home parks with investors. And the thing that I quickly realized though, is like, there's really not any such thing as passive investing unless, you know, unless you're literally investing with someone else. Like I'm right back to a hundred employees. I've got employees in 13 States. Um, we're on this acquisition binge. We're raising capital. So there's nothing really passive. It's just about building businesses and building cash flow, man. Isn't it crazy how, God, from my vision, it's like God deposited this small thing mm -hmm. in your heart, which is that almost the seed of it. Oh, yeah. logically, I, I want to get into real estate. This is interesting. Yeah. Like for me, I'm so glad that I went to an internet marketing event. Yeah, I could have gone to a construction event mm -hmm. and I'd be like, oh, I'm going to be a general contractor. This is what I, because that's just all you know. Yeah, And, and nothing wrong with it. It's no. just, it's just what... There's layers, yeah. right? It's like if I go to if I went to a software event, I'd be a software guy yeah. right now. So for you, I think that God also directs this where you had this desire, real estate. That's the seed, but then it was much bigger than mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I even I went to an event in 2019. I was very embarrassed. I spoke there, but I was literally I was taking notes from this guy who was speaking, and he quoted Psalms that said, "The righteous possess land." Mm. And I wrote it down as one of my goals. I was like, I don't possess anything. I live in California. I'm listening to Grant Cardone, like never own anything that you yeah. live in. And, and that may be true. But I, even sure. for me, I was like, well, that'd be a good start, right? So I'm like, I'm going to move to Austin. It Houses are cheap here compared to California. So I'll buy a house and, and that'll be my first one. I didn't feel it. 
So my wife and I start looking at 10 acre little lots and yeah. stuff. And I find this 30 acre lot, not good. Like meaning it's not like a perfect track next to a mall yeah. to develop. I was just like, I kicked the dirt and I'm like, dirt seems nice. Like <laughs> a little lake on it, little, little thing or whatever. And, and we tripled our money in 11 months wow. that we invested on accident. Yeah. And again, I don't believe that that's the smart way to do things, but I do believe that God deposits these small things and they can become so much bigger. Yeah. You know, it's like, they're just that little guy that if I just wasn't there for that one quote from that guy, yeah. I would have never looked for the land and then it ended up just being this freak of nature project that yeah. literally these people like, they, they didn't have to look at anything. They'd pay over appraisal, any money they bring to the table, they'd pay cash. Like, I'm like, what is going on here? Like, yeah. it's just a yeah. random piece of land. You do it the smart way, which I think is is really, really cool, man. And and what you guys have done since then. So since then, you guys have just been going after it. I think one interesting piece of it to me is with this freedom, people always consistently say this, that the money, the freedom, it's like, now what? Mm. And did you ever have a time where you got to really like, go back and really grow spiritually when you didn't have to work as much and how did that equipping kind of help now and how do you balance that faith sharpening along with business growth and mm. having up to 30 plus mobile home parks at one point yeah. it's like that's craziness man like yeah. how do you do that and man i haven't even talked about just how do you show that to your kids too but how have you guys done that with that freedom you know i i don't want to open up another can of worms but um we actually, the church that we, if it hadn't been for that church, I don't know that I'd still be in business or that pastor for that matter. You had said something earlier today. Um, but he was, you were talking about how a lot of times the money and the church are separated. Mm -hmm. But he, he actually taught me so much about leadership and business that I don't know that if it, if it hadn't been for him, I don't know that I ever would have started my own business. Wow. But then you fast forward a couple of years and the church fell apart. Like it was a disaster. Um, so this was probably, I don't know what year this was. This was probably 2000. Yeah, well, like what would make it fall apart? Um, they got very controlling, um, very driven by money. Mm. Started out amazing by the way. Um, yeah. but then, I mean, it just, it was, it was bad. Um, and finally, and what, the, what made it fall? Like what made it quit? So they got to the point where like, literally it was just about, they didn't have, they, they really didn't have any covering over them. Um, and then they started really manipulating people. Like it was all about money. Wow. Like you need to give more. And you know, but these were people that had impacted you. Yeah. Like, Big like time. meeting the leaders, like personally. Yeah. Like he was my best friend. Wow. But and he was also my pastor. Yeah. Yeah. But, but even just to hit on this a little bit, cause I believe this will relate to a lot of people. Sure. Church, church hurts a big deal, sure. but also like having a mentor of yours. I don't know if that relationship was strong afterwards, but like, that's tough to navigate your own relationship with God when a mentor of yours that has mentored you in yeah. the ways of God yeah. also is going through all this turmoil. That can yeah. really affect your own sure. stuff. Yeah. Well, there's there's two things that I'll say on that. Number one, um, growing up with the dad that I did, the moment I met God was, I'll say three things actually. The moment that I met God was the moment that I realized that um, God is so much different than any one of us can ever be because we're just, we're, we're human. And I forgive my dad. He didn't have a dad. And I learned all this later, but my dad didn't have a dad. Um, I actually found this because on Ancestry, I was trying to find my dad and I met my cousin and it was a dead end because her, my, my cousin's dad is my dad's brother, but he never knew his dad. And my dad never knew his dad. So they don't even know each other. Um, and that's just the way they grew up. And it's, you know, it talks about the Bible talks about the sins of the forefather will, you know, follow to the third and fourth generation. So I don't blame my dad for that. And I realize that God is a completely loving God. And I don't blame Pastor Franz either for, you know, what he did. He's a human. Yep. And so it really taught me um, I'm not perfect and I don't expect perfection out of you. I'm a very forgiving person at this point in time. And I think it's, I think it's through the grace of God. I mean, even from the time I was little, I think God just put a grace in me. Um, I'm just a forgiving person. And if it hadn't been for Pastor Franz, by the way, I've tried to find him a couple of times too. And he just ghosts me, man. And there, I think it's because he feels guilty around it. And I just want to tell him that, you know what? So if he's listening, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, dude, we're gonna this guy you, changed my life for the better. Like he taught me so much about faith and navigating leadership and, 
and money and business and and family and I mean I was his youth pastor like he taught me so much and I didn't harbor any you know bitterness but I will tell you there is a ton of people that are still bitter toward God um so you know church hurts and people hurts but but that's not God yeah that's not God when people get in the middle of things you know and so many times people are like how could God allow that to happen God doesn't want any of that I just anchor on you know every good and perfect gift is from above and the minute the minute that I had my first kid and then kept having kids it my, like my relationship and understanding of God has gotten even better because I don't want anything bad for my kids yeah and how much more like God in heaven right and so um you know church splits are hard people are hard um <laughs> Dr. Dufresne who is another uh pastor mentor of mine at one point in time he said every healthy body has a bowel movement <laughs> which is a crass way of just you know churches are messy people are messy but at the end of the day it's like that's not god and also one last thing i'll say on that is like we have to be careful putting any human on a pedestal because humans will always let us down including husbands and wives including fathers and sons and pastors and churches and we're people man we're messy and so the more we can keep that in mind, the less hurt we're going to experience in life because it's messy. 100%. I appreciate you sharing that as well. I know some of those things are not the most fun things to talk about, sure. but they're also things that yeah. every other person in the world, there's tons of people out there dealing with the same thing. Yeah. Same upbringing, same church situations, but also a story of a family, a person, your wife and you together, thriving, kids are thriving, all together this dynamic of continually pushing forward when there's oftentimes you could have just made a different decision. Working really hard on the job, you could have just quit and got a different job. Struggling, uh, you know, working 100 plus hours in the business, you could have, it could have been a, comp I could be interviewing you on why quitting was the good thing you should have done, but like you didn't. And for everyone listening as well, like there was a guy who told me once that you, if you, if you quit, then you lose. And if you lose, then you're a loser. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes there's power in not quitting. And so just praising you for like, giving you honor for not quitting because think of how many times that that would have been a fine thing to do yeah and giving other people strength to not quit as well and so i just man what a phenomenal story one thing i want to ask you before i let you go is there's other people out there that real estate is a very very popular thing can be sold as a very passive thing very easy sure. thing and a lot of people make big mistakes yep. right i'm sure that you've seen a lot of it or maybe even made them yourself, right? School of hard knocks. Sure. And as an overarching thing, what's a core thing of advice that you give to people that are like, I want to get into real estate or I want to deploy some funds into real estate? Because even for myself, I, I, I'm like, oh, I would like to do that. I don't really want to be that active in it. Yeah. Uh, what, what type of advice would you give to people that are looking to deploy, deploy more funds that way? So I'll split it because there's there's people that you know want to actively invest in real estate. Yeah. And I would say the answer is probably going to be the same on both fronts. If you want to actively invest in real estate, um, spend some money and spend some time, um, you know, really just learning about real estate. It's like anything else. It's not that complicated. But what we want to do is just dive into the deep end when we haven't had any swimming lessons. And so whether it's a mentor, literally, I listened to a 16 CD disc series probably eight times before I bought my first rental. A guy named Dolph DeRoos. Um, and listening to that 16 CD series, like taught me so much. So it doesn't have to be a $50,000 mastermind. I bought it on the discount table at Barnes and Noble in 2004, 2005 for like $5.98. So it doesn't have to be a $50,000 mastermind, but just decide that you're interested in real estate and just spend some time learning. Don't get too in a rush because what you're really looking for is you know, passive income, even though it's really hard to get passive income, it's a long-term thing. Remember I said I was going to buy two income producing properties yeah. a year for 10 years and that was aggressive. So this is not your full-time job. So just take your time. Don't rush in. There's seasons in, in the markets too. It's still a good time to buy real estate if you yeah. know what you're doing and yeah. you wait and find the right deal. So for the person that wants to be passive, it's somewhat similar. Um, I know a lot of investors that went to the same conference that I went to, Secrets of Successful Syndication. About 60% of the people there are operators like me that are learning, you know, more about syndication from attorneys and, you know, deal flow and other operators. And about 40% of the people there are investors 
looking to learn more from the same people in the same room as the operators. Yep. You get to meet operators, you meet, get to meet passive investors, but you get to learn from the same people. So whether it's passive or active, I don't really care what you want to get into. Spend some time learning before you just jump into it. But just like anything else in, in business, there's there's market caps, there's opportunities, there's things that are here today, gone tomorrow, there's things that have been here for a long time. So you know that you could get into a business like knitting coaching that has a very small market cap. Sure. There's only so much potential. My friend was a, a coach to pawn shops. There's about 6K in all of the US. Wow. And he only worked with ones that weren't like multi yeah. owned by a big corporation. So it's wow. even less. Yeah. Right. So there's only a certain amount you can grow. So in real estate, is there anything that you see right now that, hey, if you're going to check out some stuff, like there's this land rezoning, right? Like I was a, a part of a deal where they rezoned the land, worked with the place and got it zoned for so Amazon can build a building. Sure. And it wasn't zoned there. And so because of that, it was like, yeah. Double. They sold it for double. Yeah. Like 4.8 million to 10 million. And, and there's, so there's opportunities like that. If there is something that you're like, hey, but hey, right now, here's some couple things to check out if you are. Just like I would say, hey, if you're getting in the online space, these are the couple places that, you, that have a market cap. So people are buying yeah. stuff. So you probably want to go there. What yeah. would it be for you? So I'm a big fan of buying in the outlier areas. So like we're sitting in Austin, Texas. Yeah. I would be looking you know, in, I don't, I don't know exactly where it is, but between here and San Antonio, like there's some little outlying communities where I could buy a duplex that's very affordable. If you're looking for a duplex, like right outside of Austin, it's going to be really hard to cash flow that. But I would be looking in, you know, markets that are, that are outside where it's tertiary markets. So, you know, you're looking for markets that have 75 to 100,000 people, you know, it's bedroom communities, people that live there are, you know, traveling, an hour to work and then they go back home so it's more affordable. There's not as much demand there. And I'd buy a duplex. Like honestly, I think the duplex strategy, if I had it to do over, I'd go buy a duplex and I'd live in one side if I was a young real estate investor. And if your wife's not gonna let you do that, yeah. then go buy a duplex and, and use it to you know fund the house that you wanna live in. But just don't try to buy in the heart of where everybody else is buying. Um, and even if you have to drive an hour to go visit that thing, drive an hour because if you want it right next to you and you're living downtown, it's gonna be really hard to make that thing cash flow. Love it, dude. So you and your wife, uh, is it just Mike Ayala on Instagram? It's the Mike Ayala. The, yeah. so we gotta make sure, get the the in there, instagram.com slash the Mike Ayala. You guys also have the, the couple stuff that you guys are doing as well. Where are the places that people can get more connected to what you guys are doing, whether it be in real estate, some of the deals that you guys are doing, social, I know that you and your wife are always doing stories and stuff, so you guys are super active there. Where can they connect? Um, so for the, you know, for the couple stuff, it's uh, nextlevelcouple.com. It's pretty easy. Um, and then velocityventurepartners.com is my uh, private equity group. So Love it, dude. Well, thank yeah. you so much again. It's awesome. And for the people that made it to this part of the video, I appreciate you. If you're listening to audio as well, notice I said video, which means we're on YouTube, where you go subscribe and ring that little bell. It gives you a notification when we drop episodes of people just like this. Sometimes I even hit a solo episode in there. Also, we're on iTunes and every single other podcast platform. It would mean the world to us if you actually leave a rate and review to help us reach more people, but also my wife and I read those, our team read them, and that way it gives us inspiration to put out more stuff just like this. Thank you for being a part of another uh, episode of God's Business, and thank you, Mike. That was awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me, man.